Hello everyone, it's Aura, and welcome back to my series on running Vampire the Masquerade. In the previous episode, we took a look at uh, how to turn characters into actual people, with wants and needs and motivations. And today, we are actually going to be getting into the nitty-gritty, actually designing and running a chronicle. Uh, two things to get out of the way before the main body of the video starts. First of all, uh, at this point... Uh, after episode two, this is where, uh, generally, I would have, uh, the players start to make their characters. Because when you're designing the conflicts that are going to pervade the series, you want the PCs to be involved. So you could tie in, like, their sires, their touchstones, that sort of thing. So at this point, have your, uh, players create their characters, and then move on to this step. The second thing is to let you all know that this method that I use comes from uh, Apocalypse World games like City of Mist, Dungeon World, and especially Urban Shadows. That's right, we're dealing with a countdown clock. A countdown clock is basically a checklist, uh, to put it in very boring plain people terms, it's a checklist of things that will happen if your party doesn't get involved with a certain conflict. It's how that conflict will progress and eventually resolve. In faction-based games like this, uh, I like to start off with uh, one countdown clock for each faction. So what is each faction currently planning on doing? Uh, so today we're going to be making the countdown clocks for both the Anarchs and the Camarilla. So how do you make a countdown clock? Well, first you need to decide uh, what is the conflict going to be about? Starting with the Anarchs, we are going to say that this countdown clock is all about Baron Loin's ultimate ambition, the defeat of the werewolves. So, Anarchs versus the werewolves. Because that's fun. Uh, alright. So, once you have that set up, each clock comes generally in six stages. Shorter conflicts can be four, longer conflicts can be eight, but just for the sake of this video, we're going to stick to six. The first three uh, slots are going to be sort of the build-up, hinting at the party, hey, there is something going on here, it's something you might want to be involved with. At number four, that's when really bad things start happening. People connected to the party start getting involved. That's when NPCs start dying, that sort of thing. At number five, again, that, but turned up to ten. Things are really getting serious. And then at six, you have the resolution. Uh, which is how the conflict will end. Uh, so let's go ahead and chart this course. Uh, Anarchs versus the Werewolves. Let's say that at level one, we just want foreshadowing, we want the party, hey, there might be something going on here. Just kind of, you know, giving them a little, like, a little hint, a little tap on the shoulder. So we'll say that news spreads of werewolves spying on popular Anarch hideouts. Uh, so, you know, that's probably going to get the player's attention. Like, whoa, hey, what, there are werewolves in the city? And they're trying to, like, make a move? That's not good. Uh, but nothing is actually happening yet. Uh, it's something they can look into if they want to. But it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to come at them yet. Uh. At the second one, we'll say that uh, one of the businesses the Anarchs support, because as we said in episode one, the Anarchs like to operate through small businesses. One of the businesses the Anarchs support comes under attack by the Lupine forces. No one is killed, but the destruction to property 
He's immense. So now we know, oh, the werewolves are kind of start, starting to make their moves. Uh, which is a natural escalation from this one. Uh, and at number three, the most obvious escalation, I feel, is another werewolf attack manages to take the life of a vampire, possibly one connected to PCs. That's if you want to be real harsh. Uh, I wouldn't be that harsh in my games, but, you know, you could do it. And you could, if you wanted to, just jump from one to three, but the slow buildup gives players more time to act and not feel like they're caught off guard so severely. Which, again, maybe you want your players to be, like, super caught off guard, which is fine. This is just how I like to run my games. Uh, so now we've got the foreshadowing out of the way. Let's start really making the players miserable. Oh, one thing to amend this. Baron Loin declares war on the Lupi. So now there is a conflict starting. Everyone knows it's here. The party basically has no choice but to get involved. Uh, and if they don't get involved, well, there'll be greater consequences, such as in step four, where the Baron assembles a coterie to scout out potential lupine hideouts. One of the PC's allies is a member. Or maybe even one of the PC's gets drafted into it. Or maybe uh, the player characters are that coterie. Uh, whatever you want to do, this is just what I would do. The coterie goes missing on its first mission. Uh, so now, you know, allies are going missing. People that uh, the PCs care about are starting to go missing and possibly dying. Uh, at level 5, uh, which I like to think at point 5 is where we get to the climax, is where things really start to get serious. Generally, depending on your conflict, 5 or 6 is going to be the climax. So we'll say here... Uh, the war escalates full-blown violence with fighting in the streets. Mortal authorities are alerted, increasing Second Inquisition presence within Marovich. Uh, and the party is definitely going to get involved in this. They won't be able to step foot outside their haven without seeing just vampires and werewolves tearing into each other. Uh, and finally, uh, hmm, what would be a good end to this? Because we don't want, you know, I don't want, anyway, if the parties don't get involved in this to be the end of the Chronicle, like every vampire gets wiped out. I like the idea that Elias, the, the bear, I'm so bad at words, the Baron's right-hand man, strikes a deal with the lupine in secret. The Anarchs will sacrifice one vampire every year in exchange for the lupine leaving the city alone. Baron Lloyd comes out and declares victory for the Anarchs. So that's an end to this conflict that still leaves it open uh, for more, because uh, generally your countdown clock will last you a couple of sessions. Uh, campaigns are normally made up of uh, multiple countdown clocks. This one runs out, oh, what kind of cool plot thread could that lead to? You start a new one, that sort of thing. So as you can kind of see, this is a very natural progression from, oh, there's werewolves spying on an arcade outs too. There's this secret deal. Uh, I put Elias instead of Elias. <laughs> There's this secret deal between the Anarchs and the Lupine, uh, which again is super interesting. Leaves a lot of potential for plot thread. Uh, now, like I said, this is just a map. It's not the actual route you're going to take. So what I like to do is I like to have a thing of notes, where because obviously 
Uh, what I always like to say is the tipping point in factional conflict like this should always be the party. They're the ones that, uh, through action or inaction, will decide the fate of the city. Uh, and so naturally, uh, your plans might need to change. So let's say that uh, at some point, uh, Elias is killed. Well, uh, what do you do there? So. Uh, you might need to cross his name out and say, uh, let's actually say, ooh, Evan Ross, uh, the Camilla loyalist. So that'd be cool if Elias dies, that sort of thing. So, you know, keep an open mind. Uh, speaking of Evan Ross, let's get to the, uh, Camarilla scheme. By the way, uh, because I know some people don't know this, I only learned it recently. Uh, fun fact. Uh, to cross something out, just do Alt, Shift, and 5 at the same time. Just so you know. Uh, camera contact. Uh, because I use a lot of Google Docs. Also, uh, last thing I forgot to mention. Uh, you mark off one of these. One of these happens. Basically, if the party ignores... Uh, if the party just kind of lets it happen or actively aids it. And you could do anything. You could italicize, bold, uh, cross it out, even though that makes it harder to read. Do, 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 do. Uh, whatever you want to do just to indicate, hey, this has happened. Uh, and so let's get to the Camarilla scheme. Uh, let's say that Evan Ross is ultimately trying to establish some sort of connection to the Camarilla at large. Uh, let's say that Evan Ross begins secret correspondence with the nearby city of, uh, what's a big city near Colorado? I don't know, geography. I just realized after three videos of doing this, I've been saying Colorado like it's a city. Why do you people listen to my advice? Okay, we're gonna say Denver. With the nearby city of Denver and its primogen. Uh, let's say that uh, at this stage as well, uh, the city sends a double agent. Not a double agent, that's not the right term. A spy into Marrow Ridge to see if it's worth trying to take over. So immediately we have uh, someone is inside the city trying to take over. And even in, especially in a small, isolated community like uh, Marrow Ridge, the arrival of one new vampire is big. So that's going to be a thing. You know what, just to avoid confusion, let's give our spy a name. Uh, using Fantasy Name Generator, I got Lexi Lee of... Let's say she's a caitiff. She's a caitiff trying to actually earn some respect from the Camarilla. Uh, so naturally, uh, she's being sent to a, a dirtwater town uh, that the Camarilla is basically just like, oh, maybe we'll take it over if we can find the time. Uh, between flinging grapes at poor people. Step two. Well, let's say that Liam Murray, through the use of a, fam of a bird familiar specifically, is roped into delivering letters from Lee, the primogen of Denver. Murray is seen avoiding even the company of fellow Nosferatu. Uh, which could be interesting, especially if a party member is themselves a Nosferatu. Hmm. Let's actually get, what was her name again? Uh, the business lady who works with Ross and his people. Uh, I know she's a Tremere. Let's get her involved in this somewhere. Uh, Hecate. No. Uh, ooh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, there's, uh, Skyball, who's a news anchor, and Hecate, who's a businesswoman. Yeah, let's say Hecate gets involved in here somewhere. 
to her business allies in Denver, Hecate learns that the Camarilla wants to take the city. She strikes up a partnership with Lexi Lee, and the two become Camarilla Go and Spirators. All right, so that's it. Feels like some decent foreshadowing, cause. Uh, first of all, you have a new vampire arriving, which is weird. Uh, you have uh, a Nosferatu avoiding the companionship of his clan, which is weird. And then you have this powerful blood sorceress businesswoman uh, adopting a lowly caitiff. Well, not literally adopting, but taking under her wing a lowly outsider caitiff. Uh, those should all raise some red flags for your party. But at level four is where things start to get serious. Let's say that here, an elder of the Nosferatu intercepts Liam's messages. And he is put on trial for treason against the Anarchs. Murray's memories are manipulated by... Ross, so as not to implicate Ross in the scandal. Uh, because Ross is a Vontru and Vontru have dominate. Uh, at level 5, let's actually have the Camarilla arrive here. Alright, at level 5, uh, the Camarilla will send a coterie led by one of the Primogen of Denver to negotiate with the Anarchs. And in true Camarilla diplomacy, uh, the options are join us or die. Uh, a brief protest is quelled by the Primogen's immense power, and the Anarchs are given 48 hours to decide. Uh, and lastly, at level 6, a democratic vote leads to the Anarchs rejecting the Camarilla's offer. In return, the city of Denver, uh, let's say the Camarilla of Denver, of Denver, declare war on Merovinge, and the forces arrive, take the city. And this will begin a, much like uh, this, a full-on war. But this one's going to last a lot longer than this one. So, as you can see, we have... What feel like full and complete story arcs in and of themselves, but that leave dangling questions for the series to continue, which is always what you want. And as always, just like up here, some changes might need to be made. Like if, say, one of uh, the party members gets Murray to confide in them, then that party member instantly becomes a target for Ross once we hit uh, stage four. That sort of thing. So that was a look at the countdown clock and actually getting into planning the course of your game. In the next episode, we are going to take a look at the most important part of any tabletop game, Session 1. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you're finding this series helpful. Uh, if you have any further questions, sound off in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, stay tuned next week for the next video. I'm good at words. As always, my name is Aura. Transracts. Oh.